In the previous episode, we saw Field Marshal Polis testifying at Nuremberg. Before reviewing what happened next with the former commander of the 6th Army, let's have a brief flashback to see what he wrote in his personal diary during the last months of the war. August 29, 1944 My friends told me today that at a meeting of prisoners of war in Camp No. 27, when there was mentioned my entry into the League of German Officers and my address to the German people, one of the officers shouted, Schweiner! It was impossible to identify this man. After the meeting, a certain Lieutenant Bismann allegedly said, If Paulus was not crazy yet, he was now driven insane in Moscow. And a Lieutenant Kreger said, You can imagine that after one year, Paulus has been broken. An Oberleutnant von Berkesrode said, Paulus joined the League a few days ago. He's nuts. Here you go. That's called insubordination. Yes, it is very difficult to work with such a contingent. Hitler had much more time for their upbringing. September 10, 1944. Today I talked with Colonel Bellew again about Stalingrad and I told him how I answered the Fuhrer when I received the order to hold firm in Stalingrad. I wrote to him, Your order will be executed. Long live Germany. Let Germany live. In this I put a special meaning, let Germany live and not perish like us. Of course Hitler understood this. The Battle of Stalingrad has three periods, offensive, defensive and criminal. No matter what we achieve for this man, he kept on saying, I want more, get me the moon from the sky. Between love and hate the distance is small, now my hatred has no limits. In the evening, in conversation with the generals, we went over this topic again. I had said that until the last moment I thought that Hitler had the best of intentions, that the government would reorganize in some way and give up its policy. I must frankly admit that I believed in National Socialism. The General should not forget that we were under its influence. There was a great force leading us, which seemed to be able to achieve the goals set, and these goals were excellent. None of the Generals could have guessed that the outcome would be so different, since no one is a prophet or diviner, and everything could have been quite different. October 26, 1944. Today I agreed to respond on the radio to Hitler's propaganda accusing the Union of German officers and its president, General von Zeidlitz, of treason. November 16, 1944. Today we visited Camp No. 20. We had a good time there. But, as elsewhere, everyone speaks about the same thing. All about democracy. But not everyone has a clear idea of what democracy means. If we rebuild the state and create a democratic government, then the question arises, what kind of a democracy will there be? Bourgeois or proletarian? No one has resolved this issue yet. In general, Camp 20 is doing well. It's a good company. The generals I met immediately told me, you'd field marshal, we trust in everything. Truly nice people. The Russians correctly distributed rations Generals, officers and soldiers. Well, do you give the general and the soldier the same thing? Everyone gets according to his rank. And that's right. December 1st, 1944. Again, talking about the future of Germany with Generals Latman, Leiser and Colonel Bellew. All agree that Germany will be occupied and we will have to work there in the service of the Russians or the English. Suppose that you accept this proposal. They will say that you are a paid agent. The occupation will last, let's say, three years. The troops will leave Germany. There will be a new government. Those who have dealt with the Russians will remain. How will the people look at us?
but we must take the whole burden of this situation. It may happen that, despite all my desires, I cannot help my people. I will help with what is in my power, but then I will be thrown out like a used person. January 1st, 1945 Today, on the first day of the new year, I wrote at last a letter to my dear Nadej. I informed her that during the past year, little information about Coco, this was Paulus's wife's Constance's nickname, could be received through the generals who were captured later than we were. The latest news received from Nadej was dated November 22, 1943. She probably does not have any connection with Coco either. I wrote that I live in a country house not far from Moscow and, judging by the general situation, it's good. Almost all of the generals who are here in captivity are working with me to overthrow the current government in Germany, which caused so much harm. Naturally, at the end of the letter, the obligatory Christmas and New Year greetings. Memories, reassessments, and repentance. The self-criticism of Marshal Paulus. As the war ended in 1945, Paulus was aged 55. By this time, he had firmly decided to set things straight. Like someone who could, at last, drop a long-carried burden, he spoke in detail, freely and easily, about his past life and his service in the Wehrmacht. Just like a few other top-ranking German officers, the field marshal had been relocated to a separate dacha, a Russian cottage, in Tomolina, near Moscow, where he was now lodged permanently. One evening, addressing Soviet guests during dinner, he was especially frank. You know, I used to detest Marxists and Communists. Their ideology was alien to me, and their political basis of their teaching was incomprehensible. But I was especially hostile to the 1918 revolution in Germany. To me, a military man, it seems that a revolution during the war was like a knife thrust into the back of our nation. I could physically feel the traces of this shame inflicted on Germany. We know that, Field Marshal, they answered him. At this time, you were on Cap's side. Wolfgang Kapp was one of the leaders of the 1920 Putsch in Germany. We know that you were a member of the Kiefhuisebund organization that included officers most loyal to Hitler. Like a military subsidiary of the NSDAP, it is also known that you went to the Grenzschutz Ost Volunteer Corps. But I want to talk about something else now, something quite different, interrupted Paulus, which was very rare of him. There is no need to count my sins. There have been many of them. But I am a different person now. I am no longer anti-communist. I understand many of your ideas, and I generally accept what you espouse. After some thought, the field marshal went on. I remember several of your commanders. In 1931, they attended a course in tactics and military history with me in Berlin. These Russians were the most capable. This same year, your command invited me to give a lecture in Moscow for the Red Army Commanders. But the Reichswehr's ministry imposed a ban on my trip, and so, as it turned out, the first time I saw Moscow was years later, from the window of a car as a POW. I regret that. You have the best soldiers in the world, and yet, I would like to write about the experience of the Battle of Stalingrad. After all, I do have something to tell, he concluded. Later, Paulus managed to write a few notes that he called Retrospective Conclusions and Final Assessments. In these, he wrote, Even before the encirclement, but especially after the failed blocking attempt by 4th Panzer Army at the end of December 1942, I faced a difficult dilemma as a commander. On the one hand, I was constantly receiving categorical orders to hold positions, repeated promises of help and reports of a difficult general situation. On the other hand, seeing the incredibly distressing and increasingly worsening position of my soldiers and driven by human feelings, 
I considered not continuing the fighting. In the end, despite fully understanding the difficulties of the troops subordinated to me, I believed that one should give preference to the point of view of the command. Any unauthorized withdrawal or deliberate actions against given orders would mean taking responsibility for the fate of the neighboring troops to begin with, then for the southern sector, and thereby the entire Eastern Front. This would mean that to the eyes of the entire German people, the main part of the blame for losing the war would have fallen upon me. The army and the people would not understand such actions on my part. Such consequences would constitute a political act against Hitler, a rebellion indeed. And at that time, such an idea was not at all part of my personal consideration. It was alien to my personal nature. I was a soldier and thought that my obedience would serve my people. I am responsible to the troops and commanders of Sixth Army as well as to the German people for having complied with the orders given by the High Command to stand fast until the end. As for the responsibility of the commanders subordinated to me, from a tactical point of view, they were forced to follow my orders in the same way as I carried out the orders given to me at the operational level. Along with this belated self-criticism, Paulus made some attempts to preserve the honour of the German uniform, trying to find justifications for the offensive on Stalingrad. The conclusion to his notes ran thus. In the Soviet Union, I see a sincere ally for our future. We Germans, having made good past mistakes, need to gain the confidence of the Soviet Union and to establish close relations with it. So, in the year of victory and liberation of the German people from the Nazi yoke, Paulus' ideological evolution was finally complete. Studying Marxist literature, talking with German communists and with Soviet people, and getting to know the USSR, all this contributed to a complete critical rethinking of everything he had been through during these past years. for a new Germany. Paulus returned from Nuremberg as soon as his hearings at the trial were over. Soviet authorities wanted him back in Moscow immediately. He didn't even have time to see any member of his family during this short trip to Germany. The first one in four years. And it would be twice as long again before he could return to his homeland for good. During all these years, the captured field marshal remained in this country house near Moscow. He was Stalin's personal prisoner, and he understood this. Following Stalin's death in 1953, the Golden Cage could release its occupant at last. Paulus was one of the very last prisoners of war to eventually return home. Overall, his captivity had lasted 10 years. On November 1st, 1953, the following message was published in the Soviet press. Following the repatriation of German prisoners of war from the USSR, Field Marshal Paulus was also repatriated. Upon arrival in Germany, he remained a resident in the German Democratic Republic. Before leaving the Soviet Union, Paulus sent the following statement to the USSR government. To the Soviet government, returning from captivity to my homeland with the release of German prisoners of war, I would like to make the following statement before I leave the Soviet Union. The generous decision of the Soviet government of August 23, 1953, on the issue of prisoners of war, 
serves as new evidence that the Soviet government is not guided by a sense of revenge in its policy towards Germany. For the countless sufferings that we inflicted on the Soviet people as a result of the war that we unleashed. On the contrary, this peaceful policy makes it easier for the German people to move on to a better future. Commanding the German troops in the Battle of Stalingrad, which decided the fate of my homeland, I fully knew all the horrors of the aggressive war that were experienced not only by the Soviet people who we attacked, but also by my own soldiers. My own experience, as well as the outcome of the entire Second World War, convinced me that the fate of the German people cannot be built based on the idea of domination, but only on the basis of a long friendship with the Soviet Union. Therefore, it seems to me that the military treaties concluded in the West are not an appropriate means for the peaceful restoration of German unity and peace in Europe. Being able to return to my homeland, I decided to do my best to promote the friendship of the German and Soviet peoples. Before I leave the USSR, I would like to tell the Soviet people that I once came to their country in blind obedience as an enemy, but now I am leaving this country as her friend. October 24, 1953 Friedrich Paulus, Field Marshal of the former German Army. On October 25, 1953, Paulus was already in Berlin. He was received by the Minister of the Interior of the German Democratic Republic, Willi Stoff. The former Field Marshal then went to Dresden, where he decided to settle in a residential area of the city, Weisser Hirsch, White Deer. In Dresden, Paulus gave a course of lectures at the Higher Officers College of the GDR. He spoke about the experience of the Second World War, about the adventurous strategy of Hitler and his generals. He did not spare himself and he constantly emphasized his personal guilt for complicity in this aggression. In a lecture on the Battle of Stalingrad he said, I imagine it this way. The main cause of the German catastrophe at Stalingrad, as well as the general catastrophe that ended the war, lies in the critical underestimation of the Soviet Union by the German High Command and the overestimation of their own capabilities. The German command anticipated that the Soviet state would fall apart under the assaults of the German Wehrmacht. However, despite the most difficult trials, this state showed unprecedented resilience. The Soviet commanders showed high military qualities, and the soldiers of the Soviet army defended their homeland with astonishing tenacity and courage, while the people unwaveringly stood behind them and supplied them wherever increasing amounts of excellent weapons. Paulus said many good words about the Soviet people and went on speaking with the skill of his own experience about the Soviet military strategy. He also lectured on military history, the ancient wars of the Greeks and Romans, the Seven Years' War and the liberation of the Germans against the Napoleonic invasion, among others. In the evenings, full of plans, he wrote extensively. He began to collect material on the history of the Battle of Stalingrad drew sketches, made calculations, studied mountains of books and articles. And he walked, talking for hours with his old friend Colonel Adam, who was now head of the officers' college of the East German Army. Paulus' wife, Jelena Constance, had died in 1949, and the former field marshal never really recovered from this loss. On July 2, 1954, Paulus attended an important official press conference. It denounced the policy of force in resolving international issues, and the members of NATO that, according to the GDR government, were pushing the world into the Cold War, calling for a crusade against the USSR and communism. Paulus said, Since my return to Germany last fall, I was increasingly surprised 
that high-ranking American politicians and military officers are addressing the German question as if there was no Second World War ending in such a terrible defeat for us on German soil. And I am even more worried that in West Germany the highest government officials, as well as the press and radio, take the exact same position and, despite all the lessons of the past, once again support the policy of force preparing a war on German soil. At that time, Paulus was working on a book in which he intended to warn the Germans against repeating the fatal mistakes of the recent past, and most of all, any aggressive plans against the USSR. He emphasised repeatedly, we must all take into account that the world has changed, and that the future of the German people can only come along with friendship with all peace-loving peoples, primarily the Soviet Union, and not with a policy of power and strength. Paulus firmly held the opinion that the problems of the Germans should be resolved primarily through negotiations between the two German states. He was particularly concerned about plans for arming West Germany again and the incorporation of West German divisions into NATO forces. Here is how Colonel Adam recalls this time. One Sunday morning in late 1954, Friedrich Paulus decided to arrange a meeting of former Wehrmacht officers in both the Democratic Republic and the Federal Republic. Numerous letters, especially from West Germany, strengthened him in this intention. I was surprised to hear how specifically Paulus had already taken up this matter. He said to me, I want to explain to the West German officers that the Paris agreements deepen the split of Germany, preventing its reunification. The agreements allowed West Germany into NATO, enabling the continued deployment of foreign troops on its territory and the creation of an army of 500,000 personnel. I would like to prove that the politics of power can never lead to success again. We former officers must help the Germans from the East and West agree among themselves. I then asked Paulus if he thought that the former officers living in West Germany will understand these arguments. It will not be easy for them, the Field Marshal answered. Probably they still use the old argument of the apolitical officer about which we have so often heard in the past. I will remind you where we went with this argument. The officer must understand that as a result of his apolitical behaviour, he becomes a weapon in the hands of criminals. True, subjectively, he can act with good intentions, as we did on the Volga. However, as a result of blindly following orders, we objectively became accomplices in the criminal leadership. After all, how shamelessly Hitler took advantage of our apolitical position to the detriment of the German people and put all of us to shame. Paulus got up from his chair, walked around the spacious room, then stood right in front of me. This, my dear Adam, should be especially considered by former officers whom the government of the Federal Republic encouraged to join the West German Army. I agreed with Paulus. He nodded in the affirmative and taking a piece of paper said, I would like to end my statements with an appeal to all German officers and soldiers in the East and West do not be silent when you need to act for the very existence and future of Germany. The speech of Friedrich Paulus on January 29, 1955 in Berlin before the former Wehrmacht officers of East and West Germany made a deep impression. To the sounds of the old German soldier's song, I had a comrade. They honoured the memory of the fallen. In the 1950s, the flow of military memoirs by some of Hitler's former generals was increasing, trying to falsify history in every possible way. Paulus reacted extremely negatively to these works. He was especially indignant at Manstein's book, Lost Victories. In the summer of 1956, he said to Adam, According to what is written here, Manstein is completely innocent of the loss of Sixth Army. The man is deliberately lying. He puts all the blame on me and Hitler. You yourself were present during most of the negotiations that I led with Manstein on the radio. See the earlier video on this channel, Breakout from Stalingrad, German radio exchanges during Operation Winter Storm. You know how he hid from me the truth about the situation at the front and fettered my actions. 
And now, the former commander of Army Group Don is distorting everything. He falsifies the facts in order to mislead our people about the real causes of defeat. I once deeply respected this man. Now, like all those who have not learned anything, he deceitfully denies his responsibility for the disaster which befell Sixth Army, his responsibility for the war and its bitter end. As far as I can, I will oppose these attempts to whitewash oneself. Manstein and the Supreme Commander of the Wehrmacht, all of us, endorsing and pursuing Hitler's policy from the very beginning, are guilty of this misfortune. Whomever has at least a spark of honesty must admit this and tell the truth to the people so that Stalingrad never repeats itself. The son of the former Field Marshal, Ernst Alexander Paulus, often came to visit his father from West Germany. He recalled the bitterness Paulus noted with the conscious and deliberate prejudice with which reactionary historians tried to cover the events of World War II. Paulus wanted the Germans to correctly understand the history of World War II, rejecting militarism and revanchism. He sincerely rejoiced at the successes of the GDR in its cooperation with the USSR. And whenever he spoke, he always led the audience to the conclusion that Germans should never fight again. Paulus passed away in 1957. He could not carry on the project he had begun, the comprehensive study of the Battle of Stalingrad, his own memoirs as Commander-in-Chief. I remember meetings in the GDR with former prisoners of war. During each of them, a conversation about the former Field Marshal somehow always arose. In one of them, Heinz Kessler, Deputy Minister of Defence and Head of the Main Political Directorate of the National People's Army of the GDR, told me, smiling, Paulus was a visionary who understood the prospect of social development, and as for my own fate, he turned out to be a real prophet. Shortly after the war ended, he said to me, the time when people like me became generals has irrevocably gone. Now you will be the generals. As you can see, Paulus was right. After some time, fate found me again in Berlin, in a cosy office on Franz Josef's Strasse. It housed the community of former officers. Former colleagues of Paulus had already gathered in the office. Among them were the president of the community, Anna von Lenski, the retired Major General Leutpold Steidler, and other important figures. The conversation began at once, as it happens with old friends. First of all, they recall the episodes of the distant wars, the camp at Suzdal, and the people who worked there. One of the first to enter the conversation was Leutpold Steidler. He spoke with gratitude and warmth about how I helped put him, seriously ill and exhausted from the Stalingrad cauldron, in a Soviet hospital. This, he said, saved his life. In those minutes, I could not help but think of those fanciful, at first glance, twists of fate. Just imagine, Steidler, former regimental commander in Hitler's Wehrmacht, expresses gratitude to a Soviet officer, a communist. Then again, the conversation turned to the name of Paulus. I remember those words he said to me. The fate of Paulus was unusual and amazing, but still there was no miracle in this. It was natural, because the ideals you were fighting for, you, the Red Army and the entire Soviet people, were fair and undeniable. The truth was with you. The clever mind of Paulus could understand this. As the years went by, I often thought of the past. Memories brought me back to the fall of 1943 in the Suzdal POW camp. I was walking there with Paulus, in the already cold alleys of the monastery. After a long silent meditation, the field marshal said, In recent months, I feel like I'm living a second life. The first remained somewhere far away, and its outlines are fading more and more. My second life began on the Volga, in Stalingrad. The second life of Friedrich Paulus was much shorter and more difficult than the first, but having suffered a crushing defeat as a commander, he won the most difficult victory, the victory over himself, and he managed to find the road of honesty and a road that began here, in Russia. <laughs>